Hello, this is SpellSkyZMTG, and today we're going to be looking at my Rune of the Hidden Realm deck. This is a blink deck. Uh, so, what does Rune do? Uh, he costs two green, white, and a blue. He's a 4 4 Rhino Soldier. He's got Vigilance and Trample, and he can pay two. Excellent of a target creature. Turn that card to the battlefield under its own control at the beginning of the next end step. So, in this deck, we're going to be utilizing, utilizing ends the battlefield with abilities. Uh, Leave the battlefield abilities and just make a sort of control deck which we can eventually amass enough creatures to overwhelm our opponents and attack. So how are we going to be starting off this game? So first up we have our ramp category. So these are so first up we have the creatures which can be blinked. We've got wood elves that finds a forest. We have Solemn Simulacrum, which finds any land. Same with Farhaven Elf. We've also got Elvish Rejuvenator, which gets one from the top six, or five even. Uh, if you're going to cut a card, this will be the first one I cut. Spring, Spring Bloom Druid, which sacrifices one and you get another one. Um, and that's it for the ones we can blink. Then we have creatures which untap permanents. So we've got Vizier of Tumbling Sand, so that untaps a permanent. And same with Curious Follower. This is great because we can use them as a ramp in the early game. Then we can transition them into untapping runes so we can use them multiple times. Uh, next we have a ramp spell. We've got Search for Tomorrow. We can cost three, get a basic onto the battlefield, but you can suspend it on turn one for a green. And then it'll resolve on turn three. So, very good card there. We've also got Soul Ring, generic, most commander decks. Lano Visionary, and the battlefield, draw a card. We can blink it, and it also taps for a green. It's got Kiora, Behemoth, Beckoner. Never creature power four, Wraith enters, we draw a card. So you've got a bit of card draw there. We've also got an untap target permanent again, so we can use rune multiple times. We can ramp in the early game. So, how are we going to be blinking creatures? So, of course, we've got Rune. But we also have uh, Flicker Engines. So, we've got Conjurer's Closet. Um, at the beginning of your end step, you may X or target creature you control and then turn up cards to the battlefield under your control. So, this is just gets off value every single end step. And that's the same with Soul Herder, but this has, um, whenever... Creatures exile from the battlefield, you put a plus and plus encounter on it, so this can grow and become a large threat during the endgame. We then have uh, Ephemerate. Um, I'm a bit cheap and I didn't use the actual card, but this says exile target creature you own, then return it to the battlefield under its own control, and it's got rebound so you can cast it during your upkeep. So this can be used to protect against a removal spell, but it can also be used to reuse, leave, and end to the battlefield abilities. Uh, Next we have Miss Meadow Witch and Flicker Wisp. Flicker Wisp X or something to the next end step once. And Miss Meadow Witch, you can pay four and do it over and over again. So this you can use, if you've got a lot of mana, you can use it to save your board from a board wipe. That's very good there. The needs to exile, this one exiles any number of creatures you want and then and puts them underneath them. So this can be board wipe protection. So you can put five creatures underneath here and then when you board wipe, you can make all those creatures back use all their ATBs and then this can just be a large threat on its own even with just two creatures exiled it's an 8-6 so 8-9 sorry next we have Urine Sky Nomad um, cost 3 and Azorius Azorius and we don't compare about, care about companion claws when it ends Bathford you exile any number of target non-land permanents you control and return those cards to Bathford in the next end step so that can also be used to uh, untap mana rocks if you want to use them again also reset a cure if you want to. So we're going to now going to get our control east part of the deck with our removal. So we've got Reclamation Sage, three mana in the battlefield, destroy target artifact or enchantment. Mangara of Corridor, uh, it taps and exiles target permanent, and along with Mangara. What you can do is you can save Mangara of Corridor so because with that, because the exile Mangara of Corridor is part of the resolution trigger not part of the cost, so we can tap Mangara, we can put the trigger on the stack, then we can use Rune, blink Mangara, it exiles the creature, but then Mangara is no longer here, so we get to keep Mangara, and he comes back at the next end step, so we can just keep on exiling our opponent's stuff whenever we want. Next up you've got Duplicant, when it enters exile, target non-token creature, uh, we don't really care about the bottom bit, this just exiles stuff and gets rid of it permanently. Very good there. Manglehorn, a bit of hate bear. 
When in Spathful, destroy target artifacts and artifacts your opponent's control in Spathful tapped. And we can just blink this, destroy our opponent's mana rocks, and it also slows them down a lot, a lot as well. Next we've got Terastodon, probably the meanest card in the deck. This destroys up to three target non-creature permanents, and uh, they create an elephant for each permanent they had, which was destroyed this way. So this one you can blink over and over again, destroy everyone's lands, that's the way you can win the game. However, if you don't want to win like this, you can just use it to blow up people's value engines and stuff like that. Acidic Slime destroys uh, target land, artifact and enchantment, and it's got death touch as well, so this is a very good blocker. And we can also blow up problematic lands like guys' cradles and stuff. Beast of In destroys target opponent, makes a 3-3, three, 3 three mana instant speed, very flexible there. Thorn Mammoth, whenever a creature enters, or this enters, you get to fight target cr creature an opponent controls. So we can flick this over and over again, basically wipe our opponent's borders of creatures. We've also got some token makers in this deck as well, so that will trigger lots of times and we can clear most boards. Skyclave Apparition, probably one of the best removal spells in the deck. When it enters, you exile up to target, uh, up to one target, non-land, non-token permanent, you don't control with CMC 4 or less. And when this leaves, they make a XX Blue Illusion, so we can just keep on flickering it. They lose their permanent, but they only get an illusion back. So they lose their permanent permanently. We get to keep um, the, up their board free. Next is Reflector Mage. Enters return target creature and opponent controls to its owner's hand. And that creature's owner can't cast spells with the same name as that creature until your next turn. So this one we can bounce their commander. You can just bounce stuff we don't particularly want to deal with. Um, and it's often better than destroying stuff. Because they can't do anything with that card in their hand for a while. Next you have two copy effects, uh, the worst one being Clever Impersonator. These are very good because you can flick them and choose to copy something else. However with Clever Impersonator, if you don't choose a creature, it will no longer be a creature. Just be careful with that one. And then Progenitor Mimic is exactly the same but it can only copy creatures, but then during your upkeep you keep on getting a copy of that creature. So let's say you copied a Thrag Tusk here. You get Thrag Tusk every single upkeep. Next up, we do have Thrag Tusk. When it enters, you gain 5 life. And when it leaves, you make a 3 3. So when you flick this, you're going to gain 5 life and you're going to make a beast, which is incredibly powerful because you can do lots of stuff with that. Fierce Empath, when it enters, you get a creature of CMC 6 or greater and then put it into your hand and then shuffle li your library. Uh, you can get finishers with this, um, you can get recursion with this. It's just a very flexible card in the deck which allows us to get cards we need in the right situation. Next up we've got Coiling Oracle. When it enters, reveal the top card of your library. If it's a land card, put it onto the battlefield, otherwise that put that card into your hand. Semi ramp, semi card draw. I just put it in the flicker category. Very good early game there. Next we have sort of a hate pig. It's a 4-4 four, four for 4 mana. When it enters, you get a forest and a plains. Basic, so you can put them into your hand and then shuffle your library. And then players can't pay life or sacrifice non-land permits to cast spells or activate abilities. Uh, this is very effective because you've got a lot of sacrifice decks in my meta. You could probably swap this out for a Gaddock Teague if you wanted to, but that's what I've got. Next you've got Deep Forest Hermit, and, and so you make four squirrels, and squirrels you control get plus and plus one. The Vanishing 3 doesn't matter so much because uh, you can just flicker it before those counters go away, so your squirrels will always get plus and plus one. You can just make an army of squirrels that you can pump up with something and then raise four hunters later on in the game. Sun Titan, when it enters, return target permanent card with CMC 3 or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. You can get about to fetch lands with this. And a lot of the creatures have power uh, CMC 3 or less as well. So you get to reuse enter the battlefield abilities as well. For your graveyard. Rebel Arc, uh, everybody hates this card. When it leaves, return up to two target creature cards of power 2 or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. This gets back most of the creatures in our deck. Um, so if someone board wipes and then we evoke this or play it afterwards and flicker it, uh, it's incredibly powerful because you can just get back loads and loads of stuff from your graveyard, get back into the battlefield abilities, get back copy creatures. It's just a cre incredibly effective. Then Skullwinder, when it enters, return target card from your graveyard to your hand and the opponent does the same. You can swap this out for an Eternal Witness, but... My Eternal Witness is in a different deck, so I'm keeping it in here at the moment. Um, it's perfectly fine, and it's also political, which this deck can do as well. 
because with rune you can blink your opponent's stuff for value for the uh, benefit of them. And you can also blink attackers like a Maze of Ith. So that's why rune is so good because he's so flexible in what you can do. Next up is Merc Fiend Liege. Green creatures you control get plus one plus one. Blue creatures you control get plus one plus one. The majority of our creatures are in either of those two categories. Um, it does cost two green blue, green blue, green blue. Um, so not the most difficult thing to cast but not the easiest either. But then the main part of it is untap all green and blue creatures you control during each player's untap step. This allows us to use rune once every turn. Seed bomb use is better but I haven't got a seed bomb use yet. Just if you have the money, swap out the Merc Fiend Liege for a Seaborn Muse because um, I've been able to get hold of a Seaborn Muse yet, but make sure you, you definitely do swap those around. Or you can put both of them in if you want. Next up is Wilderness Reclamation. Four mana, but if end step, step, untap all lands you control. This also allows us to play, use our mana uh, all on our turn, then have still have mana left to activate rune, cast counter spells, and use interaction and stuff. So that's also very good. Next up, Strynic Resonator. Uh, you can pay two and copy target triggered ability you control, and you may choose new targets for the copy. This we can copy into the battlefield abilities and things like Aid from the Cow. But if your end step, if permanent you control left the battlefield this turn, you roll the top card of your library, and if it's a permanent card, you can put it on the battlefield, otherwise, you put it on the bottom. This just gets up value over and over again at the end step because um, you're usually going to blink stuff, something once every turn. Next up, Swift Foot Boots. Uh, a quick creature has Hexproof and Haste. Um, and equip for one. And then a quick creature has Haste and Shroud, equip for zero. Um, that's just to put on the room so you can play it and then instantly use it. Uh, and also to protect him because he. During the early game, he's not doesn't really do much. You just sit there with two mana open to Maze of If something, but in a late game. If you've got loads and loads of stuff you can blink, um, people are going to be scared of rune. Because you can blink Terastom or something, block their lands, and they can't do anything about it because the Terastom's already gone. So rune can protect your stuff, so people are going to want to get rid of him, so that's why Lightning Greaves are so good. Next up we've got Negate, counter target non-creature spell. Uh, stop a board wipe, stop a removal spell. And then same with Fierce Guardian, Shiv, except this one's free if you control your commander. Next up, Shasta Sky. Uh, each player who controls a creature with power 4 greater, our commander's 4 power, draws card and destroy all creatures. Austere Command. Oh, yeah, these are board wipes, by the way. Uh, 6 mana, choose 2, destroy artifacts, destroy all enchantments, destroy all creatures with CMC 3 or greater, destroy all creatures with CMC 4 or greater, so you get to be flexible. Usually, you're going to choose power 4 greater, and maybe artifacts or enchantments or something. It's just very flexible, and you can use it around the situation. Tragic Arrogance, a very underrated board wipe. Five mana. For each player, choose among the permanents that player controls from an artifact, a creature, an enchantment, and a planeswalker, and sac they sacrifice the rest. Uh, excluding lands, of course, because that would be a bit mean. But this one you can use to basically pick and choose what the opponent gets to cheat, uh, keep. We get to choose to keep rune or something, so very good there. And then time wipe, destroy all creatures again, but we get to save something by bouncing it to our hand. That costs two double white and a blue. Next up, we have some finishers. We've got end race four runners. When it ends the battlefield, creatures you control get plus two, plus two, and then vigilance and trample. And it's got vigilance, trample, and haste itself. In this deck, we're going to make play a lot of small creatures, um, and it just pumps them all up and makes them big. And Cultivator of Blades, when it attacks, uh, each creature gets plus X, plus X, where X is its power, but it's got Fabricate too. So this one, uh, when it attacks, it'll usually have stuff plus 3, plus 3, but you can blink it to make the servos, to make our board bigger as well. You probably swap it for a Crater Hoop if you have the money, but I unfortunately don't. Next we've got a card draw section. Um, so we've got card creatures which you can blink, which draw you cards. By themselves. So this one draws a card for each opponent you control for your creatures you and you. You know have a lot of creatures, so you're using a draw upwards of two cards. 
Cloud Blazer went into us, you draw two, gain two. Uh, just a better Mole Drifter. And of course, we do have Mole Drifter as well. Um, which we can blink to draw more cards. Same with Cloud Blazer. This gains us life as well, which can be quite profitable as well. We've got Kruger, the Macro Sage. Don't compare that with the Companion phrase again. You could have Kruger as your companion, but your deck would be a lot slower, so I'm not particularly popular on the idea. And then Spassful, draw a card for each permanent you control for CMC 3 or greater. All of our permanents are 3 CMC, in fact, so they work with Sun Tides now, and they work with Karuga. Uh, next up, we have Watch for Tomorrow, Hide Away. Uh, when it enters, you put a card from your top 4 face down underneath it. When it leaves, you put the card into your hand. This one can be played early game, and then it's on attack, so you can block with it, and you get the card into our hand. And we can also blink it to get the card as well. Then we've got card draw engines. We've got Garrick's Uprising, Fathom Mage, uh, Soul of the Harvest. When a creature enters, we draw a card. Guardian Project might be better, but that's like seven or eight pounds now, and I'd have solved the whole harvest anyway, so. When a creature enters, you draw a card, and it's a 6 6 with so Trample. So next up, we have Fathom Mage. Uh, this has Evolve, meaning whenever a creature of greater power of toughness enters Bath it gets a counter. And whenever a counter is put on it, you draw a card. This costs 2 a green and a blue, and has a 1-1. One, one. So when most creatures enter Bath this will get a counter and will draw a card. But after a certain amount, we won't be able to draw any more, because there won't be any bigger creatures. However, a rune, we can blink this, and we can draw more cards. Next, we have Garrick's Uprising, whenever... Creature with powerful grace renters, we draw a card, and then creatures you control of trample. And then when it enters the battlefield, if you control a creature powerful grace, you draw a card as well, but that's not quite as relevant. This draws us cards for our, some of our larger creatures when they enter. Also gives us trample, which is very effective um, to have on our smaller creatures. Next up, we have one of the best cards in the deck for the Champion of the Worlds. Two in a green, four loyalty planeswalker. You may cast creature spells as they have flash. You can con uh, in combination with uh, Wilderness Reclamation, uh, you can cast things on other people's turns, uh, which means you have a lot of surprise potential in a creature deck, which is very, very helpful. Um, and then plus one, until your next time, it's a one target creature gains Vigilance and Reach into the turn, not quite as relevant. Then minus two, look at the top three cards of your library, and then exile one face down and put the rest on the bottom of your library in any order. As long as that card remains exiled, you may look at that card and you may cast it if it's a creature card. So it's a bit of card draw, it's a bit of just generic uh, utility. Next up we have Fact or Fiction. Uh, just another card draw spell, cost 4 mana. For the top 5 cards of your library, an opponent can separate those cards into 2 piles. You put one into your hand and another into your graveyard. This one just draws us cards, it's quite simple. And Vivian Monster's Advocate, this is another one of our best cards in the deck. Cost 5 mana, so it has 3 loyalty. And then you may look at the top card of your library at any time. And you may cast creature spells from the top of your library, so more card draw there. Plus one, create a 3 3 beast creature token. Put your choices of a vigilance counter, a reach counter, or a trample counter on it. You can use this to protect Vig uh, Vivian. And then a minus two, when you cast your next creature spell this turn, search library for a creature card with lesser converted mana cost and put it onto the battlefield, then shuffle your library. This is incredibly powerful because we can pay a six mana spell and get a five mana spell, which might synergize with that. So you can cast Progenus and Mimic, but then we can also get Frag Tusk. Um, Meaning we can just keep on making Thrag Tusk over and over again. It's just very generically powerful. Finally, we have our lands. So you've got four Simic lands. You've got Yavmai Coast, taps for a colourless, or green or blue, but it deals with damage. Hinton Harbour enters taps unless you control a forest on an island. Or we're often going to control one of those. Juvenating Springs enters the battlefield tapped unless you control two or more opponents. Most of the time, this is enters the battlefield untapped. And Temple of Mystery uh, taps green or blue when it enters you scry one. Very good card there. And we have Temple of Enlightenment, does the same, but taps for white or blue. Skycloud Expanse, we pay a 1, and it go adds white or blue. And then Prairie Stream and Spathfield taps, unless you control two or more basic lands. We then have Cross and Verge, uh, when it and Spathfield taps, and taps for a colourless. And you can pay 2 and search library for a Plains or a Forest card, and put them on Plains and a Forest card, sorry, and put them on Spathfield taps. This is Ramp, and it fixes us for all of our colours, because we have uh, a white-blue land, and we also have just basic forests. I used to have a breeding pool in there, but that's been moved to a different deck. But you can always upgrade the mana base if needed. And Sesia Sanctuary, 
I always put a bounce land in any deck I make in case someone plays Temple of Discovery, meaning you can get um, a card draw off the Temple of Discovery. Next up we have Seaside Citadel. This taps for all of our colours and enters tapped. Command Tower taps for all our colours, enters untapped. Exotic Orchard uh, taps for one mana of any colour that land an opponent controls could, could produce. Then Evolving Worlds, uh, we can get this back with Sun Titan, so it's very good. Then Mossor Bridge taps for a green and it's got Hideaway. Uh, and anyway, so you look at the top four cards of your library and, and exile one face down, then put the rest on the bottom. And you can also pay it. Uh, tap it and pay a green. You may pay the exile card without paying its mana cost if seen, if your creatures have total power 10 or greater. We're often going to have that. So you can just play a free large creature. Or just board wipe or something. If an opponent's really out of control or something. And it's just generic value on a land. Which doesn't really take up a slot. Reliquary Tower, no maximum hand size. Often you can have stupidly big hands in this deck with things like Karuga and Macrosage. So Reliquary Tower is very important. Bonds Enclave, uh, taps for colourless, or you can pay three and draw a card and activate this ability only if you control a creature power four or greater. It's very good when we have Wilderness Reclamation because we don't always have something to do with that mana. So you can then uh, sink the mana into this and just draw an extra card. Then we have eight forests, eight plains, and six islands. So that was our mana base. Um, often find the way this deck works is you play a ramp spell on turn 2 or turn 3 get rune out on turn 4 and you can play something to blink on turn 5 or leave the mana, leave rune out with some mana open to basically maze of if something so you can just use this as a political tool for a while um, you can also use it to blink your ramp creatures if you have any and then just get a critical mass of lands and so you can start flooding the board with utility creatures or removal creatures and just do general blinking shenanigans. This deck will, uh, will be featured on a gameplay episode soon. I don't know if that will come out before this or after this. I don't know how long it will take me to edit. But that is a, a game with Rude in it. I do not win, but I, if I got another turn I probably would have won. But you can just say that anyway and no one would really care. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this rune of the Hidden Realm deck. I'll put the link for the deck list in the description below. Thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed. Goodbye.